Chapter 12 of The Million Dollar Suitcase by Alice McGowan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Million Dollar Suitcase. Chapter 12 A Murder. I stood at the door and watched until I saw first Chung's head come into the light on the kitchen porch, then Jim Edwards's black pole follow it. I waited until both had gone into the house and the door was shut before I went back to Barbara and Worth. They were speaking together in low tones over at the hearth. Three of us were alone, and the blood stain on the rug, out of sight there in the shadow beyond the table, would seem to cry out as a fourth. Barbara, I broke in across their talk, who was the woman who came here to this place last night? She didn't answer me. Instead, it was Worth who spoke. Better come here and listen to what Bob's has been saying to me, Jerry, before you ask any questions. I crossed and stood between the two young people. Well, I grunted, and though Barbara's face was white, her eyes big and black, she answered me bravely. Mr. Gilbert did not kill himself. Worth doesn't think so either. What? It was jolted out of me. After a moment's thought, I finished. Then I've got to know who the woman was that visited this room last night." For a long while she made no reply, studying Worth's profile as he stared steadily into the fire. No signal passed between them, but finally she came to her decision and said, "'Mr. Boyne, ask Worth what he thinks I ought to say to that.' Instead, "'Who was it, Worth?' I snapped, speaking to the back of the young man's head. The red came up into the girl's face, and her eyes flashed, but Worth merely shrugged averted shoulders. "'You can search me,' he said, and left it there. I looked from one to the other of these young people. Worth, whom I loved as I might have my own son, had I been so fortunate as to possess one. This girl, who had made a place of warmth for herself in my heart in less than a day, whose loyalty to my boy I was certain I might count on. How different this affair must look to them from the face it wore to me, an old police detective, who had bulled through many inquiries like this, the corpse itself, perhaps, lying in the back of the room, instead of the bloodstain we had there on the rug. What was practically the third degree being applied to relatives and friends, with the squalid prospect of a court trial ahead of us all? If they'd seen as much of this sort of thing as I had, they would be holding me up now tying my hands that were so willing to help, by this fine-spun, overstrained notion of shielding a woman's name. "'Barbara,' I began, I knew an appeal to the uncountable worth would get me nowhere. The facts we've got to deal with here are a possible murder, with this lad the last person known, by us of course, to have seen his father alive. We know, too, that they quarreled bitterly. We know all this. Outside people, men who are interested, and more or less hostile, were aware that Worth needed money, needs it yet, for that matter, a large sum. I suppose it is a question of time when it will be known that Worth came here last night, and when it is known, do you realize what it will mean?" Worth had sat through this speech without the quiver of a muscle, and no word came from him as I paused for a reply. Little Barbara, big eyes boring into me, as though to read all that was in the back of my mind, nodded gravely, but did not speak. I crossed to the shelves and took down the diary whose leather back bore the date of 1916. As I opened it, finding the place where its pages had been removed, I continued, "'You and I know, we three here know,' I included Worth in my statement, "'that the crime was neither suicide nor patricide.' but it is likely we must have proof of that fact. Unless we find the murderer. But the motive! There would have to be motive!" Barbara struck right at the core of the thing. She didn't check at the mere material facts of how a murder could have been done, who might have had opportunity. The fundamental question of why it should have been done was her immediate interest. I believe I've the motive here. I said, and thrust the mutilated volume into her hand. Someone stole these leaves out of Mr. Gilbert's diary. The books are filled with intimate details of the affairs of people, things which people prefer should not be known. 
names, details, and dates written out completely. It's likely murder was done last night to get possession of those pages. She went to the desk and glanced over the book, not the minute examination with the reading glass which I had given it, the mere flirt of a glance which, when I had first noticed it the night before at Tate's, skimming across that description of Clate, had seemed so inadequate. Then she turned to me. Mr. Gilbert cut these out himself, she pronounced. That brought Worth's head up and his face around to stare at her. You say my father removed something he had written? he asked. Barbara nodded. He never changed a decision, and those books were his decisions. Then this wasn't a correction, but he cut it out. Can't you see, Mr. Boyne? Those leaves were removed by a man who respected the book and was as careful in his mutilation of it as he was in its making. It is precisely written, I am referring to workmanship, not its literary quality, carefully margined, evenly indented on the paragraph beginnings. And so, in this removal of three leaves, the cutting was done with a sharp knife drawn along the edge of a ruler. I picked up from where they lay on the blotting pad a small pearl-handled knife, its sharp blade open, and the ruler I had seen when looking down from the skylight, and placed them before her. She nodded and continued. There is a bit of margin left so no other leaves could be loosened by this removal. The marking out of the run-over has been neatly ruled, done so recently that the ink is not yet black, done with that ink in the stand. It was blotted with this. She lifted a hand-blotter to show me the print of a line of ink. There were other markings on the face of the soft paper, and I took it eagerly. Barbara smiled. You will get little from that, she said. I had not even seen her give it attention. Scattered words, and parts of words, blotted frequently as they were written. Perhaps with care we might learn something, but we can turn more easily to the last pages of his diary, and— There are no last pages, I interrupted. The 1920 book is missing. Gone? Stolen? she exclaimed. It brought a smile to my face. For the first time in my experience of this pretty little bunch of brains, she had hazarded a guess. Gone, I admitted coolly, a bit sarcastically. I've no reason to say stolen. But, yes, you have. You have, Mr. Boyne. If it is gone, it was stolen. Is it gone? Are you sure it is gone? Eagerly, her eyes were searching desk, cabinet, the shelf where the other diaries made their long row. I satisfied her on that score. I have searched the study thoroughly. It is not in this room. Was here last night, Worth cut in. I saw it on the desk. And was stolen last night, Barbara reaffirmed quickly. These books are too big to be slipped into a pocket, so we can't believe it was left upon Mr. Gilbert's person and he wouldn't lend it, wouldn't willingly let it go from his possession. So it was stolen, and the man who stole it killed him." She shuddered. That was going too swift for me to follow, but I saw on Worth Gilbert's face his acceptance of it. Either conviction of Barbara's infallibility, or some knowledge locked up inside his own chest, made him certain the diary had been stolen, and the thief was his father's murderer. In a flash I remembered his words, putting every damn word of our row into it, and I shot straight at him. Did you take that book, Worth? He only shook his head and answered, You heard what Bob said, Jerry. If he took the book, he killed his father. That was Barbara's inference, Worth's acceptance. I threw back my shoulders to cast off the suspicion, then reached across to place my fingers under the girl's hand and pull from it the only record of that last written page, the blotter. "'Will you read me that?' I asked her. "'Every word and part of a word, every letter.' Her eyes smiled into mine with a reassurance that was like balm. Worth rose and found her a hand-glass on the mantel, passing it to her, and with this to reverse the scrawlings, she read and I wrote down in my memorandum book two complete words two broken words, and five single letters picked from overlying marks that were too confused to be decipherable. Though the three of us struggled with them, they held no meaning. Worth's interest quickly ceased. 
I'll join Jim Edwards in the house, he said, but I stopped him. One minute, Worth. There was a woman visitor here last night. It would seem she carried away with her the diary of 1920 and three leaves from the book of 1916. I want you, you and Barbara, to tell me what you know that happened here in Santa Isabel on the dates of the missing pages, May 31 and June 1, 1916. Barbara accepted the task, turning that wonderful cinematograph memory back, and murmured, I never tried recollecting on just a bare date this way, but— then glanced around at me and finished. Nothing happened to me in Santa Isabel then, because I wasn't in Santa Isabel. I was in San Francisco, and— And I was in Flanders, so that lets me out, Worth broke in brusquely. I'll go into the house. Wait, Worth. I placed a hand on his shoulder. Go on, Barbara. You had that thought of something. Yes. Father died in January of that year and in March I had to vacate the house. It had been sold, and they wanted to fix it over. I left Santa Isabel on the 18th of March, but they didn't get into the house until June 1st. Again Worth interrupted. Which jogs my memory for an unexciting detail. He smiled enigmatically. I was jilted June 1st. In Flanders? How many times had this lad been jilted? No, right here. I wasn't here, of course, but the letter which did the trick was written here and bore that date, June 1, 1916. How did you get the date so pat? It was handed me by the mail orderly, I was on the Verdun sector then, on the morning of the 4th of July. Remember the date the letter was written because of the quick time it made. Most of our mail took from six weeks to eternity. What are you smiling at, Bobs? Just a little, you don't mind, do you, at your saying you remember Ina's letter by the quick time it made in reaching you. Who bought your house, Barbara? I asked her. Dr. Bowman, or rather Mrs. Bowman's uncle, bought it and gave it to her. And they went in on the 1st of June, 1916? I was all excitement, turning the pages of the diary to get to certain points I remembered. What can either one of you tell me about the state of affairs at that time between Dr. Bowman and his wife, and that man who was just in here, Jim Edwards? Worth turned a hostile back. Barbara seemed to shrink in her chair. I hated like a whipping to pull this sort of stuff on them, but I knew that Barbara's knowledge of Worth's danger would reconcile her to whatever painful thing must be done, and I had to know who was that visitor of last night. Is that— that stuff in those damnable books? I saw the hunch of Worth's broad shoulders. Some of it is. Some of it has been cut out, I replied. And you connect Jim Edwards with this crime? I don't connect him. He connects himself, by them and by his manner. Burn them. He faced me, came over and reached for the book. Dump the whole rotten mess into the fire, Jerry, and be done with it. Easy said, but that would sure be a short cut to trouble. Tell me, I've got to know, if you think this man Edwards, under great provocation, capable of, well, of killing a fellow creature. Jerry, Worth took the book out of my hand and laid it on the table. What you want to do is to forget this, dirt, that you've been reading, and go at this thing without prejudice. If you open any trails and they lead in my direction, don't be afraid to follow them. This thing of trying to find a criminal in someone that my father has already deeply injured, someone that he's made life a hell for, so that suspicion needn't be directed to me, makes me sick. If I'd allowed you to do it, I'd be yellow clear through. That was about the longest speech I'd heard Worth Gilbert make since his return from France and he meant every word of it, too. But it didn't suit me. This hue to the line stuff is all right until the chips begin whacking the head of your friend. In this case, there wasn't a doubt in my mind that when a breath of suspicion got out that Thomas Gilbert had not killed himself, that minute would see the first finger point at Thomas Gilbert's son as the murderer. So I grumbled. Just the same, Edwards has something on his mind about last night. He has, 
and it's pretty nearly tearing him to pieces," Worth admitted, but would go no further. "'He was here last night, I'm sure, and Mrs. Bowman was with him,' I ventured. Barbara, who had been sitting through this, her eyes on Worth, turned from him to me and pronounced gently, "'Yes, he was here, and Laura was with him.' "'Bob's!' Worth spoke so sternly that she glanced up startled. I'll not stand for you throwing suspicion on Jim. Did I do that? Her lip trembled. Worth's eyes were on the fire. Don't quarrel with the girl, I remonstrated. Barbara had told me the visitor. I covered my elation with, She's only looking out for your safety. I can look out for myself, curtly. He turned hard eyes on us. It made me feel put away from him, chucked out from his friendship. And I never quarreled with anybody in my life. Sometimes, he turned from one to the other of us, speaking slowly, sometimes I seem to antagonize people, for no reason that I can see, and sometimes I fight, but I never quarrel. No offense intended, or taken, I assured him hastily. My heart was full of his danger, and I told myself that it was his misery spoke, and not the true Worth Gilbert. But a very pale and subdued Barbara said tremulously, "'I guess I'd better go home now,' suggesting, after the very slightest pause, "'Mr. Boyne can take me.' "'Don't, Bobsy.' Worth's voice was gentle again, but absent. It sounded as though he had already forgotten both of us and our possible cause of offense. Go to the house with Jerry. I'll bar the door and follow. Can't I help with that? I offered. No. Eddie will give me a hand if I need it. Go on. I'll be with you in a minute. End of chapter 12《The Million Dollar Suitcase》by Alice McGowan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Million Dollar Suitcase. Chapter 13. Dr. Bowman. But it was considerably more than a minute before Worth followed us to the house. We walked slowly, talking. When I looked back from the kitchen porch, Worth had already come outside, and I thought Eddie Hughes was with him though I heard no voices and couldn't be sure, on account of the shrubbery between. Getting into the house we found that Chung had the downstairs all opened up through, lights going, heat turned on from the basement furnace. Everywhere that tended, home-like appearance a competent servant gives a place. On the hall table as we passed I noticed a doctorish topcoat, with a primly folded muffler laid across it. "'Dr. Bowman is here.' Barbara said, hardly above her breath. We listened. No sound of voices from the living room. Then I got the tramp of feet that moved back and forth in there. We opened the door, and there were the two men, a queer proposition. Bowman had taken a chair pretty well in the middle of the room. It was Jim Edwards whose feet I had heard as he roamed about. No word was going between them. Apparently they hadn't spoken to each other at all. The looks that met or avoided were those strange looks of persons who lived in lengthened and what might be termed intimate hostility. "'Ah, Boyne, isn't it?' Bowman greeted me. I thought our coming relieved the situation. He shook hands, then turned to Barbara with, "'Mrs. Thornhill said you were here. I told her I would bring you back with me.' I rather wondered not to hear him insist on being taken at once to the study but his next words gave the reason. He'd reached Santa Isabel too late for the inquest itself, but not too late to make what he informed us was a thorough investigation of everything it treated of. Barbara and I found places on the Davenport. Edwards prowled up and down the other end of the room, openly in torment. Those stormy black eyes of his were seldom off Bowman, while the doctor's gray, heavy-lidded gaze never got beyond the toes of the restless man's moving boots. He had begun a grumbling tale of the coroner's incompetence and neglect to reopen the inquest when he, the family physician, arrived, as though that were important, when Worth came in. Instantly the doctor was on his feet, 
had paced up to the new master of the house and began pumping his arm in a long handshake, while he passed out those platitudes of condolence a man of his sort deals in at such a time. The stuff I'd been reading in those diaries had told me what was the root and branch of his friendship with the dead man. It made the hair at the back of my neck lift to hear him boasting of it in Jim Edwards' presence, and know what I knew. "'And, my dear boy,' he finished, "'they tell me you've not been to view the body yet. I thought perhaps you'd like to go with me. I can have my machine here in a minute. No?' As Worth declined with a wordless shake of the head. I hoped he'd leave then, but he didn't. Instead, he turned back to his chair, explaining, "'If Mrs. Thornhill's cook hadn't phoned me, when Mrs. Thornhill had a second collapse last night, I suppose I should be in San Francisco still. The coroner seemed to think there was no necessity for having competent medical testimony as to the time of death and the physical condition of the deceased. I should have been wired for. The inquest should have been delayed until I arrived. The way the thing was managed was disgraceful. It was merciful. Jim Edwards spoke as though unwillingly, in a muttered undertone. Evidently, it was the first word he'd addressed to Bowman, if he could be said to address him now, as he finished, I hadn't thought of an inquest. Yet, of course, there'd be one in a case of suicide. Bowman only heard and wholly misconstrued him, snatching at the concluding words. Of course it was suicide. Done with his own weapon, taken from the holster where we know it always hung, fully loaded. The muzzle had been pressed so close against the breast when the cartridge exploded that the woolen vest had taken fire. I should say it had smoldered for some time. There was a considerable hole burned in the cloth. The flesh around the wound was powder-scarred." Worth took it like a red Indian. I could see by the glint of his eye, as it flickered over the doctor's face, the smooth white hands, the whole smooth personality, that the boy disliked and had always disliked him. Yet he listened silently. I rather hoped by leading questions to get Bowman to express the opinion that Thomas Gilbert had been killed in the small hours of the morning. Circumstances then would have fitted in with Eddie Hughes. Eddie Hughes was to me the most acceptable murderer in sight. But no, nothing would do him but to stick to the hour the coroner had accepted. Medical science cannot determine closer than that. He was very final. The death took place within an hour preceding midnight. "'You are positive it couldn't be this morning?' I asked. "'Positive.' Well, Dr. Bowman's testimony, if accepted at the value the doctor himself placed upon it, would clear worth of suspicion, for the lad was with me at Tate's from a few minutes past ten until after one. And Jim Edwards, now pacing the floor so restlessly, had also been there the greater part of that time. I had had too much experience with doctors' guesses based on rigor mortis to let it affect my views. In the minute of silence we could hear Chung moving about at the back of the house. The doctor spoke querulously. Never expect anything of a Chinaman, but I should think when the chauffeur found the body he might have had the sense to summon friends of the family. He could have phoned me. I was only in San Francisco. He could have phoned me at the ranch. Jim Edwards' deep voice came in. "'You? Why should he phone for you?' Bowman wheeled on him at last. "'I was the man's physician, as well as his close friend. Everybody knows you weren't on good terms with him. Gad, you wouldn't be here in this house tonight if he were alive.' In the sort of silence that comes when someone's been suddenly struck in the face, Worth crossed to Edwards, laid an arm along his shoulders. I've asked Jim to stay in my place here, in my house, while I'm away over Monday, and he can do as he likes about whom he chooses to have around." Bowman gradually got to his feet, his face a study. "'I see,' he said. "'Then I'll not trespass on your time any longer. I felt obliged to offer my services, patience of mine, for years, in affliction.' A gleam of anger came into his fishy eyes. I've been met with damned insolence, claiming of the house before your father's decently in his grave." He jerked fully erect. 
Leave your affairs in the hands of that degenerate. If he doesn't do you dirt, you'll be the first he's let off. Come, Miss Barbara," to the girl who sat beside me, looking on mutely observant. Thank you, doctor. She answered him as tranquilly as though no voice had been raised in anger in that room. I think I'll stay a little longer. Jim will take me home. The doctor glared and stalked out. To the last I think he was expecting someone to stop him and apologize. I suppose this was what Worth described naively as antagonizing people without intending to. Well, it might not be judicious. I certainly was glad the doctor was so sure of the time at which his friend Gilbert had met death. Yet I couldn't but enjoy seeing him get his. As soon as the man's back was turned, Edwards beckoned Barbara to the window. Worth and I left them talking together, there in low tones, he to get something he wanted from a case in the hall, where he called me to the phone, saying long distance wanted me. While I was waiting for my connection, Central, as usual, having got me, now couldn't get the other party, the two came from the living room, and Barbara said good night to us in passing. Those two seem to have something on hand, I commented as they went out. The little girl gave Bowman one for himself, in the nicest possible way. Don't wonder Edwards likes her for it. Poor Laura Bowman! Her friends take turns giving that bloodless lizard she's tied to one for himself any time they can," Worth said. My mother used to handle the doctor something like that, and now it's Barbara, little Bobsy Wallace. God bless her. He went on into the dining room. I looked after his unconscious, departing figure and thought he deserved a good licking. Why couldn't he have spoken that way to the girl herself? Why hadn't he taken her home, instead of leaving it to Edwards? Then I got my call and answered. This is Boyne. Put them through. In a minute came Robert's voice. Hello, Mr. Boyne? Yes, what you got? Telegram. Hicks, Los Angeles. He's located Steve Skeels. Read me the wire. I broke in. All right. A pause, then. Skeels arrived here from Frisco this morning. Shall I arrest? Good. I exclaimed. Wire him to keep Steve under surveillance and await instructions. Tell him not to lose him. Get it, Roberts? Hustle it. I'll be in by nine. Goodbye. And I hung up. I looked around. Worth had gone into the dining room. I stepped to the door and saw him kneeling before an open lower door of the built-in sideboard, and noted that the compartment had been steel-lined and Yale-locked, making a sort of safe. A lamp at the end of an extension wire stood on the floor beside him. He looked around at me over his shoulder as I put my head in to say, "'Stock in your old suitcase has gone up a notch, Worth. We've caught skeels.' "'So soon?' was all he said. But my news seemed to decide something for him. With a sharp gesture of finality, he put into his breast pocket the package of papers he had been looking at. When, a little later, Edwards came in, Worth was waiting for him in the hall. "'Do we go now?' the older man asked, wincing. Worth nodded. "'Take your machine, Jim,' he said. "'We can park it at Fuller's and walk back from there. Boyne's Roadster is in our garage.' "'Anything wrong with Eddie Hughes?' Edwards asked as he stepped in to get his driving gloves. "'I passed him out there headed for town lugging a lot of freight.' and the fellow growled like a dog when I spoke to him. I fired him. Come on, Jim. Let's get out of this. Hold on, Worth. I took a hand. Fired Hughes? When? While I was fixing up that door, after you and Bob's came to the house. What in God's name for? I asked in exasperation. For giving me back talk, said the youth who never quarreled with anyone. He and Edwards tramped out together. I realized that the hostile son and an alienated friend had gone for a last look at the clay that had yesterday been Thomas Gilbert. Of course Worth would do that before he left Santa Isabel. But would Edwards go in with him, or was he only along to drive the machine? It might be worth my while to know. But I could ask tomorrow. It wasn't worth a tired man's waiting up for. We must make an early start in the morning. I went upstairs to bed. End of chapter 13
Chapter 14 of The Million Dollar Suitcase by Alice McGowan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Million Dollar Suitcase. Chapter 14 Seven Lost Days. Instead of driving up to San Francisco with Worth and Barbara, the next morning I was heading south at a high rate of speed, sitting in the Pullman smoker, going over what had happened and what I had made of it, vainly studying a small blue blotter with some senseless hieroglyphics reversed upon it. I wasn't at all sure that this move of mine was anywhere near the right one, but the thing hit me so quick had to be decided in a flash, and my snap judgment never was good. We were all at breakfast there at the Gilbert House when I got the phone that those boobs down in Los Angeles had let Skeel slip through their fingers. I could see no way but to go myself. When I went out to retrieve my handbag from the roadster, there was Barbara already in the seat. I delayed a minute to explain to her. She was full of eager interest. It seemed to her that Skeel's ducking the detectives that way was more than clever, almost worthy of a wonder man. "'Slickest thing I ever knew,' I grumbled. You can gamble I wouldn't be going south after him if Skeels hadn't shown himself too many for the Hicks agency, and they're one of the best in the business." Worth came out and settled himself at the wheel. He and Edwards exchanged a last, low-toned word, and they were ready to be off. Barbara leaned towards me with shining eyes. "'Perhaps,' she said, "'Skeels might even be Clayt.' Then the roadster whisked her away. The bulk of Worth Gilbert's fortune was practically tied up in this affair. Even as the Pullman carried me Los Angeles word, that boy was getting in to San Francisco, going to the bank, and turning over to them capital that represented not only his wealth but his honor. If we failed to trace this money, he was a discredited fool. Yes, I had done right to come. So far on that side. Then apprehension began to mutter within me about the situation at Santa Isabel. How long would that coroner's verdict of suicide satisfy the public? How soon would some seepage of fact indicate that the death was murder, and set the whole town to looking for a murderer? The minute this happened, the real criminal would take alarm and destroy evidence I might have gathered if I had stayed by the case. I promised myself that it should be simply there and back with me in the Skeels matter. This is the way it looked to me in the Pullman. Then, once in Los Angeles, I allowed myself to get hot telling the Hicks people what I thought of them, explaining how I'd have run the chase and wound up by giving seven days to it, seven precious, irreclaimable days, while everything lay wide open there in the North and I couldn't get any satisfactory word from the office and none of any sort from Worth. That Skeels trail kept me to it, with my tongue hanging out. Again and again I seemed to have him. Every time I missed him by an hour or so, and that convinced me that he was straining every nerve, and that he probably had the whole of the loot still with him. At last I seemed to have him in a perfect trap, Ensenada on the peninsula. You get into and out of Ensenada by steamboat only except back to the mines on foot or donkey. The two days I had to wait over in San Diego for the boat, which would follow the one Skeels had taken, were a mighty uneasy time. If I'd imagined for a moment that he wasn't on the dodge, that he was there openly, I'd have wired the Mexican authorities and had him waiting for me in jail. But the Mexican officials are a rotten lot. It seemed to me best to go it alone. What I found in Ensenada was that Skeels had been there, quite publicly, under his own name. He had come alone and departed with a companion, Hinch Dial, a drill operator from the mines, a transient, a pickup laborer, seemingly as close-mouthed as silent Steve himself. Steve had come on one steamer and the two had left on the next. The northbound boat we passed two hours off Point Loma was carrying Skeels and his pal back to San Diego. Again, two days lost, waiting for the steamer back, and when I got to San Diego the trail was stone cold. I had sent Worth almost daily reports in care of my office, not wanting them to lie around at Santa Isabel during the confusion of the funeral and all, but even before I went to Ensenada, 
Telegrams from Roberts had informed me that these reports could not be delivered as Worth had not been at the office, and telephone messages to Santa Isabel and the Palace Hotel had failed to locate him. When I believed I had Skeels firmly clasped in the jaws of the Ensenada trap, I had sent a complete report of my doings up to that time, and the optimistic outlook then to Barbara with instructions for her to get it to Worth. She would know where he was. But she hadn't. Her reply, waiting at San Diego for me, a delicious little note that somehow lightened the bitterness of my disappointment over Skeels, told me that she had seen Worth at the funeral, almost a week ago now, but only for a minute, that she had supposed he had joined me on the Skeels chase, and she would now try to hunt him up and deliver my report. Roberts, too, had a line in one of his reports that Worth had called for the suitcase on the Monday I left and had neither returned it nor been in the office since. I worried not at all over Worth. If he wanted to play hide-and-seek with the Dykeman spotters, he was thoroughly capable of looking after himself. But in the Skeels' matter, I did then what I should have done in the first place, of course, turn the work over to subordinates and headed straight home. I reached San Francisco pretty well used up. It was nearly the middle of the forenoon next day when I got to my desk and found it piled high with mail that had accumulated in my absence. Roberts had looked after what he could and sorted the rest ready for me. Everything concerning the Clate case was in one basket. As Roberts handed it to me, he explained. The Van Ness bank attorney, Cummings, has been keeping tabs on you tight, Mr. Boyne. Here every day, sometimes twice. Wants to know the minute you're back. I grunted and dived into the letters. Nothing interesting. Responses acknowledging receipts of my early inquiries. Roberts lingered. Well? I shot at him. He moved uneasily as he asked, Did you wire him when you were coming back? Cummings? No. Why? He telephoned in just before you came saying that he'd be right up to see you. I told him you hadn't returned. He laughed and hung up. All right, Roberts. Send him in when he comes. I dismissed the secretary. Cummings was keeping tabs on me with a vengeance. What was on his chest? I didn't need to wait long to find out. In another minute he was at my door greeting me in an offhand, Hello, Boyne. Ready to jump into your car and go around with me to see Dykeman? Just got down to the office, Cummings. I watched him, trying to figure out where I stood and where he stood after this week's absence. Haven't seen Worth Gilbert yet. What's the rush with Dykeman? You'll find out when you get there." Not very friendly, seeing that Cummings had been Worth's lawyer in the matter, and aside from that queer scene in my office, there'd been no actual break. He stood now, not really grinning at me, but with an amused look under that bristly mustache, and suggested, "'So, you haven't seen young Gilbert?' The tone was so significant that I gave him a quick glance of inquiry as I said, "'No, what about him?' Put your coat on and come along. We can talk on the way," he replied, and I went with him to the street, dug little Pete out of the boot-black stand and herded him into the roadster to drive us. Cummings gave the order for North Beach, and as we squirmed through and around congested downtown traffic, headed for the Stockton Street Tunnel, I waited for the lawyer to begin. When it came, it was another startling question. Didn't find skeels in the South, eh? I hadn't thought they'd carry their watching and trailing of us so far. I answered that question with another. When did you see or hear from Worth Gilbert last? Not since the funeral, he said promptly. The day before the funeral, a week ago today, to be exact. I ran down to make my inventory then, as administrator, you know. He looked at me so significantly that I echoed, Yes, I know. Do you? How much? His voice was hard and dry. It didn't sound good to me. See here, I put to him, as my clever little driver dodged in and out through the narrow lanes between pagoda-like shops of Chinatown, avoiding the steep hill streets by a diagonal through the Italian quarter on Columbus Avenue. If there's anything you think I ought to be told, put me wise. I suppose you raised that money for worth, the seventy-two thousand that was lacking, I mean. I did not. I turned the situation over and over in my mind, and at last asked cautiously, Worth did get the money to make up the full amount, didn't he? 
We've swerved again to the north, where the Powell car line curves into Bay Street, and we're headed direct for the wharves. Cummings watched me out of the corners of his eyes, a look that bored in most unpleasantly, while he cross-examined. So, you don't know where he raised that money, or how, or when. You don't even know that he did raise it. Is that the idea? I gave him look for look, but no answer. An indecisive slackening of the machine, and little Pete asked, Where now, sir? You can see it, Cummings pointed. The tall building. Hit the Embarcadero, then turn to your right, a block to Mason Street. So close to the dock that ships lay broadside before its doors, moored to the piles by steel cables, the Western Cereal Company plant scattered its mills and warehouses over two city blocks. Freight trains ran through arcades into the buildings to fetch and carry its products. Great trucks, some gas-driven, some with four- and six-horse teams, loaded sacks or containers that shot in endless streams through well-worn chutes, or emptied raw materials that would shortly be breakfast foods into iron conveyors that sucked it up and whined for more. It was a place of aggressive activity among placid surroundings, this plant of Dykeman's, for its setting was the Italian fisherman's home district. Little frame shacks, before which they mended their long brown nets, or stretched them on the sidewalks to dry. Fisherman's Wharf and its latine-rigged, gaily painted hulls was under the factory windows. We pulled up before the door of a building separate from any of the mills or warehouses, and I followed Cummings through a corridor, past many doors of private offices, to the large general office. Here a young man at a desk against the rail lent Cummings respectful attention. The lawyer asked something in a low tone, and was answered, "'Yes, sir, waiting for you. Go right through.' Down the long room with its rattling typewriters, its buzz of clerks and salesmen, we went. Cummings was a little ahead of me, when he checked a moment to bow to someone over at a desk. I followed his glance. The girl he had spoken to turned her back almost instantly after she had returned his greeting, but I couldn't be mistaken. There might be more than one figure with that slim, half-girlish grace about it, and the other hair as lustrously blue-black, but none could be wound around a small head quite so shapely, carried with so blossom-like a toss. It was Barbara Wallace. So this was where her job was. Strange I had not known this fact of grave importance. I went on past her unconscious back, left her working at her loose-leaf ledgers, beside her adding machine, my mind a whirl of ugly conjecture. Dykeman's employee. That would instantly and very painfully clear up a score of perplexing questions. Dykeman would need no detectives on my trail to tell him of my lack of success in the Skeels chase. Lord! I had sent her as concise a report as I could make, to her for worth. I walked on stupidly. In front of the last door in the big room, Cummings halted and spoke low. Boyne, you and I are both in the employ of the Van Ness Avenue Bank. We're somewhat similarly situated in another quarter. I'm representing the Gilbert estate, and you've been retained by Worth Gilbert. I grunted some sort of assent. I brought you here to listen to what the bank crowd has to say, but when they get done I've something to tell you about that young employer of yours. You listen to them, then you listen to me, and you'll know where you stand. I'll talk with you as soon as I get through here, Cummings. Be sure you do that little thing. Significantly, and we went in. End of chapter 14《Chapter Fifteen of the Million Dollar Suitcase by Alice McGowan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Million Dollar Suitcase, Chapter Fifteen, at Dykeman's office. We found Whipple with Dykeman. I had always liked the president of the Van Ness Avenue Bank well enough, one of the large, smooth, amiable sort, not built to withstand stress of weather, apt to be rather helpless before it. He seemed now mighty upset and worried. Dykeman looked at me with hard eyes that searched me, but on the whole he was friendly in his greeting and inquiries as to my health. While I was getting out of my coat and stowing it, making a great deal of the process so as to gain time, 
I saw Cummings was exchanging low-spoken words with the two of them. I tried to keep my mind on these men before me, and why I was with them. But all the while it would be running back to the knockout blow of seeing that girl in Dykeman's place. She was double-crossing Worth. I might have grinned at the idea that I'd let myself be fooled by a pair of big, expressive, wistful, merry black eyes, but I had seen the look in those same eyes when they were turned on my boy. To think she looked at him like that, and sell him out, was against nature. It was hurting me beyond all reason. Whipple asked me about my trip south as though it was the most public thing in the world, and he knew its every detail, and accepted my reply that I couldn't take one man's pay and report to another, with, "'Just so, Mr. Boyne. But your agency is retained, regularly, year by year, by our bank, and our bank has given over none of its rights, I should say duties, in regard to the Clayt case. We stand ready to assist anyone whose behavior seems to us that of a law-abiding citizen. We don't want to advance any criminality. We can't strike hands with outlaws." "'Tell him about the suitcase, Whipple. Dykeman broke in impatiently, rather spoiling the President's oratorical effect. "'Tell him about the suitcase!' The suitcase! Was this one of the things Barbara Wallis had let out to her employer? She could have done so. She knew all about it. "'One moment, please,' I snapped. "'I've been away for a week, Mr. Whipple. I don't know a thing of what you're talking about. Did Captain Gilbert fail to meet his engagement with you Monday morning?' Whipple shook his head. Mr. Dykeman wants you told about the suitcase, he said. I'd like to have Knapp here when we go into that. Dykeman picked up the end of a speaking tube and barked into it. Send those men in. In the moment's delay, we all sat uneasily mute. Knapp came in with Anson. As they nodded to us and settled into chairs, two or three others joined us. Nothing was said about this filling out of the numbers, but to me it meant serious business with Worth Gilbert its motive. "'Get it over, can't you?' I said, looking about from one to the other of the men, all directors in the bank. "'I understand that Captain Gilbert met his engagement with you. Was he short of the sum agreed?' Again Whipple shook his head. "'Captain Gilbert walked into the bank at exactly ten o'clock Monday morning. The, uh, uh, unusual arrangement, contract, to call it so, that we made with him concerning the defalcation would have expired in a few seconds, and I think I may say—he looked around at the others—that we should not have been sorry to have it do so, but he brought the sum agreed on. I drew a great sigh of relief. Worth's bargain was complete. He was done with these men, anyhow. I was half out of my chair when Whipple said, sharply for him, "'Sit down, Mr. Boyne.' and Mr. Dykeman almost drowned it in his, "'Wait there, Boyne! We're not through with you!' "'There's more to tell,' Whipple continued. "'Captain Gilbert brought that eight hundred thousand cash and securities in a, er, uh, in a very strange way.' "'What do you mean, strange way? Airplane or submarine?' I growled. "'He brought it,' Whipple's words marched out of him like a solemn procession, in a brown sole-leather suitcase. "'With brass trimmings,' Dykeman supplemented, and leaned back in his chair with an audible, ah, of satisfaction. If ever a poor devil was flabbergasted, it was the head of the Boyne Agency at that moment. I had a fellow feeling for that Mazeppa party who was tied in his birthday suit to the back of a wild horse. Locoed broncos were more amenable to rain than Worth Gilbert. So that was why he wanted that suitcase. Had a use for it, he put it. Insisted on an order to be able to get it if I wasn't at my office. Wanted it to shove back at these scary bank officials, with his own money for the payment inside. No wonder Whipple called him an outlaw. "'Get the idea, do you, Boyne?' Anson lunged at me in his ponderous way. "'The rest of us thought was a poor joke, but Knapp and Whipple had both seen that suitcase before and recognized it." "'Yes,' said Knapp quietly. "'It chanced I saw it go through the door that last day, when it had nearly a million of our money in it. And here it was.' His voice broke off. "'Certainly startling,' Cummings spoke directly at me. 
for them to see it come back in Worth Gilbert's hands, with the same kind of filling, less one hundred and eighty-seven thousand dollars. Of course, I didn't know the identity of the suitcase until they'd given Gilbert his receipt and he was gone. Oh, they accepted his money, I said, and every man in the room looked sheepish, except Cummings, who didn't need to, and Dykeman, who was too mad to. He shouted at me. Yes, we took it, and you're going to tell us where he got that suitcase. What have your own detectives, those you hired on the side, to say about it? I countered on him and saw instantly that the whipple end of the crowd hadn't known of Dykeman's spotters and trailers. Well, why not? Dykeman shrilled. Why not? Who wouldn't shadow that crook? One hundred and eighty-seven thousand dollars! Worked us like suckers! Come ons! He choked up and began to cough. Cummings came in where he left off. See here, Boyne. We don't want to antagonize you. You've said from the first that this crime was a conspiracy, a big thing, directed by brains on the outside. Clayt was the tool. Whose tool was he? That's what we want to know." And Ensign trundled along. "'These men who have been in the war get a contempt for law. There's no doubt about it. Captain Gilbert might—' "'No names!' Whipple's hand went up in protest. "'No accusations, gentlemen, please. Mr. Boyne, this is a dreadful thing. But, really, Captain Gilbert's manner was very strange. I might say he—' "'Swaggered.' supplied Cummings coolly as the President's voice lapsed. "'Well,' Whipple accepted it, "'he swaggered in and put it all over us. There he was, a man fresh from the deathbed of a suicide father, that father's funeral yet to occur. I, personally, hadn't the heart to question him or raise objections. I was dazed.' "'Dazed?' Dykeman snapped up the word and worried it as a dog worries a bone. Of course we were all dazed. It was so open, so shameless. That's why he got by with it. Making use of his position as heir, less than forty-eight hours after his father was shot. After his father shot himself, Ripple's low end tone was a plea. After his father shot himself. Huh! snorted Dykeman. If a man shoots himself, he's been shot, hasn't he? Hell! What's the use of whipping the devil round the stump that way? Boyne, you can stand with us, or you can fight us. Boyne's with us. Of course he's with us. Whipple broke in, his words a good deal more confident than his tone or the look of his face. Well, then, Dykeman ground out, when our thief of a teller splits that one hundred and eighty-seven thousand with his man Gilbert— Shut up, Whipple, shut up! You can't stop me! We're going to know about it. We'll get them both, then, and send them across. And we'll recover one hundred and eighty-seven thousand dollars that belongs to the Van Ness Avenue Bank. Good night. I got to my feet. This lets me out. I can't deal with men who make a scrap of paper of their contracts as quick as you gentlemen do. Stop, Boyne. You haven't got it all. Dykeman ordered me. Yes, wait, Mr. Boyne. Whipple came in. You haven't a full understanding of the enormity of this young man's action. Mr. Cummings has something to tell you which, I think, will— Nothing Mr. Cummings can say, I shut them off, will alter the fact that I am employed by Captain Worth Gilbert at your recommendation, at your own recommendation, that I have been away more than a week on his business, and have not yet had an opportunity to report to him personally. When I've seen him, I'll be ready to talk to you. You'll talk now or never. Dykeman's shrill threat was interrupted by the shriller bell of the telephone. He yanked the instrument to him, and the hello he cried into it had the snap of an oath. He looked up and shoved the thing in my direction. Calling for you, Boyne, he snarled. There was deathly stillness in the room, so that the whir of the great stones in the mill came to us instantly. I sat there, they all watching me, and spoke into the transmitter. This is Boyne. Hold the receiver close to your ear so it won't leak words. The warning wasn't needed. I thought I knew the voice. Press the transmitter close to your chest. Listen, don't talk. Don't say a word in reply to me. I'm in the telephone booth outside. I must see you just as soon as I can. 
I'll be at the Little Italy restaurant, you know, don't you, on Fisherman's Wharf, in ten minutes. If you can come, and alone, find me there. I'll wait an hour. If you can't come now, you must see me this evening after working hours." "'I'll come now,' I raised the transmitter to say, and quickly over the wire came the answer. "'I told you not to speak in there. This is Barbara Wallace.'" End of chapter 15「Sixteen of the Million Dollar Suitcase by Alice McGowan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Million Dollar Suitcase, Chapter Sixteen, A Luncheon. I went away from there. Looking about me, I had guessed that pretty much every man in the room believed that it was worth Gilbert with whom I had been talking over the phone. Dykeman's traders would be right behind me. Yet to the last, Whipple and his crowd were offering me the return trip end of my ticket with them. If I would come back and be good, even now all would be forgiven. I sized up the situation briefly and took my plunge, shutting the door after me, glancing across the long room to see that Barbara Wallace's desk was deserted. Nobody followed me from the room I had just left. I walked quickly to the outer door. Little Pete switched on his engine as I leapt into the car. My let her go wasn't needed to make him throw in his clutch and give me a flying start straight ahead down the broad plankway of the Embarcadero. Looking back as we hit the Beltline tracks, I saw a small car with two men in it shoot out from one of the wide doorways of the plant. But as we rounded the cliff-like side of Telegraph Hill, my view of them was cut off. Things had come for me thick and fast. I felt pretty well balled up. But the girl had used secrecy in appointing this interview till I could see further into the thing it was anyhow a safe bet to drop them. Pete, I said, lose that car behind us. Only ten minutes to slip them and land me at Fisherman's Wharf. Show me what for. He grinned. Between Montgomery and the Bay, north of California Street, there are many narrow byways, crowded with the heavy traffic of hucksters and vegetable men, a section devoted to the commission business. Into its congestion Pete dove with a weasel instinct for finding the right holes to slip through, the alleys that might be navigated in safety. In less than the ten minutes I'd specified, we were free again on Columbus Avenue, pursuit lost, and headed back for the restaurant on the wharf. "'Boss!' little Pete was hoarse with the excitement he loved, as he laid the roadster alongside the Little Italy. "'Was it on the level, what you fed the lawyer guy? Ain't you wise to where Captain Gilbert is?' I've seen him frequent since you've been gone." "'How many times is frequent, Pete?' I asked. "'And when did the last frequent happen?' "'Twice,' sulkily. I'd wounded his pride by not taking him seriously. But he added, as I jumped down from the machine, "'I drove him up on the hill, round the place where you and him and her went that day.'" Pete didn't need to use Barbara Wallace's name. The way he salaamed to the pronoun was enough. The swath that girl cut evidently reached from the cradle to the grave, with this monkey grinning at one end and me doddering along at the other. I gave a moment to questioning Pete, found out all he knew, and went into the restaurant, wondering what under heaven Barbara Wallace would say to me or ask me. The Little Italy restaurant is not so bad a place for luncheon. If one likes any eatables the Western Seas produce, I heartily recommend it. Where fish are unloaded from the smacks by the ton, fish are sure to be in evidence, but they are nice, fresh fish, and look good enough to eat. And the Little Italy is clean, with white, oilcloth tables and a view from its broad windows that downtown restaurants would double their rent to get. Just now it was full of noisy patrons, foreigners mostly people too busy eating to notice whether I carried my head on my shoulders or under my arm. In a far corner Barbara Wallace's eyes were on me from the minute I came within her sight. She had ordered clams for two, mostly, I thought, to defend the privacy of our talk from the interruptions of a waiter, and I was hardly in my chair before she burst out, "'Where's Worth? Why wasn't he in that office to defend himself against what they're hinting?' "'I suppose,' I said dryly, because he wasn't given an invitation to attend. You ought to know why. You work for Dykeman." "'I work for Dykeman?' she repeated after me in a bewildered tone. 
I'm bookkeeper in the Western Cereal Company's employ, if that's what you mean. You understood so from the first. You know I didn't. I reproached her hotly. Do you think I'd have let you on in the inside of this case if I'd known it was a pipeline direct to Dykeman? And on the instant I spoke there came to me a remembrance of her saying that Sunday morning as we pulled up before the St. Dunstan, that she went past the place on the streetcar every day getting to her work at the Western Cereal Company. Sloppy of me not to have paid better attention. I knew vaguely that Dykeman was in one of the North Beach mills. Fifty-fifty, Barbara, I conceded. I should have known, made it my business to learn. And Dykeman has questioned you. He has not, indignantly. I don't suppose he knows Worth and I are acquainted. I could have smiled at that. There were detectives' reports in Dykeman's desk that recorded date, hour, and duration of every meeting this girl had had with Worth and with myself. Besides, Cummings knew. It must have been through Cummings that she learned what was about to take place in Dykeman's private office. What had she told Cummings? I was ready to blurt out the question when she fumbled in her bag with little shaking hands, drew out and passed to me unopened the envelope addressed to Worth, with my detailed report of the Skeels chase. I did my best to deliver it. She steadied her voice as she spoke. He wasn't at the palace. He wasn't at Santa Isabel. He didn't communicate with me here." My edifice of suspicion of Barbara Wallace crumbled. Cummings had not learned through her that I was unsuccessful in the South, nor had she spilled a word to him that she shouldn't, or they'd had the dope on where Worth had found that suitcase and thrown it at me quick. "'Barbara,' I said, "'will you accept my apologies?' "'Oh, yes,' she smiled vaguely. "'I don't know what you're apologizing for but it doesn't matter. I hope you would bring me news of Worth, of where he is." "'When did you see him last?' "'On the day of the funeral. I hardly got to speak to him.' Little Pete's news was slightly later. He'd taken Worth up to the Gold Nugget and dropped him there. Thursday, Worth was at the Nugget for more than an hour. On both occasions, Pete was told to slip the trailers and did. That meant that Worth was working on the Clate case, or thought he was. I told her of this. Yes, oh yes, she repeated listlessly. But where is he now? And awful things, things like this meeting coming up. What besides this meeting? At Santa Isabel. What? Things that have happened since the boy's gone? You couldn't get much idea of the lay of the land when you were down there Wednesday, could you? Oh, but I could. I did. Earnestly. Of course it was a large funeral. It seemed to me I saw everybody I'd ever known. At a time like that nothing would be said openly, but the drift was all in one direction. They couldn't understand Worth, and so nearly every one who spoke of him picked at him, trying to understand him. Mrs. Thornhill's cook was already telling that Worth had quarreled with his father and demanded money. I shouldn't wonder if by now Santa Isabel set the exact hour of the quarrel. Me for down there as quick as I can," I muttered, and Barbara, facing me sympathetically, offered, "'I've a letter from Skeet Thornhill.' She groped in her bag again, mumbling as women do when they're hunting for a thing. "'It came this morning. Mrs. Thornhill's no better, worse, I judge. Oh, here it is,' and she pulled out a couple of closely scribbled sheets. "'The child writes a wild hand,' she apologized, as she passed these over. The flapper dashed into her letter with a sort of incoherent squeal. The carnival ball was only four days off. Everybody was already dead on his, her, or its feet. The decorations they'd planned were enough to kill a horse, let alone getting up costumes. "'As usual, everything seems to be going to the devil here,' she went on. "'Got a cannery girl elected festival queen this time. Ina's furious, of course. Mom's had a letter from her that singed the envelope but I sort of enjoy seeing the cannery district break in. They've got the money these days." Nothing here to my purpose. Barbara reached forward and turned the sheet for me, and I saw Worth Gilbert's name halfway down it. Dr. Bowman is an old hellcat, and I hate him. Skeet made her points with a fine simplicity. Since Mother's sick, he comes here every day, 
though what he does but sit and shoot off his mouth and get her all worked up is more than I can see. Yesterday I was in the room when he was there, and he got to talking about Worth, the meanest, lowest-down hinting talk you ever heard. Said Worth got a lot of money when his father died, and I flared up and said, what of it? Did he think Mr. Gilbert ought to have left it to him? That hit him, because he and Mr. Gilbert used to be good friends, and he and Worth aren't. I sassed him, and he got so mad that just as he was leaving he hollered at me that I'd better ask Worth Gilbert where he was at the hour his father was shot. Now what do you know about that? That man is spreading stories. A doctor can set them going. He's making his messy old calls on people all day, and they, poor fishhounds, believe everything he says. Though mother didn't. After he was gone she just lay there in her bed and said over and over, that it was a lie, a foolish, dangerous lie. Poor Mumsy, she's so nervous that when the grocer's truck had a blowout down the drive she nearly went into hysterics, cried and carried on, something about its being the shot. I suppose she meant the one when Mr. Gilbert killed himself. Wasn't that queer? Any loud noise of the sort sets her off that way. She lies and listens and listens and mutters to herself. It scares me. She closed with, Please don't break your promise to be here through this infernal bloss, Fess." "'Good advice, that last,' I said slowly, as I laid the letter on the table, keeping a hand on it. "'You'll do that, won't you, Barbara?' I had intended to. I was given leave from this afternoon. But, well, I thought it over, and almost made up my mind to go back to my desk. Barbara Wallace, uncertain, halting between two courses of action. What did it mean? See here, Barbara, this isn't a time for Worth Gilbert's friends to slacken on him. I hadn't slackened, she said very low, and left it for me to remember that Worth apparently had. Then you're needed at Santa Isabel, I urged. But you're going, aren't you, Mr. Boyne? Yes, as soon as I can get off. That doesn't keep you from being needed. Worth's one of the most efficiently impossible young men I ever tried to handle. Maybe he's not any fuller of shocks than any other live wire, but he sure does manage to plant them where they'll do the most harm. Cummings, Dykeman, and this Dr. Bowman down there, active enemies. They can't hurt Worth Gilbert, all of them together. Wait a minute. I'm going to Santa Isabel to find the murderer of Thomas Gilbert. That means a stirring to the depths of that little town. This underneath-the-surface combustion will get poked into a flame. She's going to burst out, and somebody's going to get burned. We don't want that to be worth, Barbara." No. But what can I do? What influence can I have with him? She was beginning, but I broke in on her. Barbara, you and I are going to find the real murderer, before the cummings Dykeman bunch discover a way into and out of that bolted study. Those people went to see Worth in jail." There was a long pause while she faced me, the rich color failing a little in her cheeks. I see, speaking slowly, studying each word. And as long as we didn't find out how to enter and leave the study, we have no way of knowing how hard or how easy it's going to be for them to find it out. We, her voice still lower, we can't tell if they already know it or not. Yes, we can, I leaned forward to say. The minute they know that, Worth Gilbert will be charged with murder. I hit hard enough that time to bring blood, but she bled inwardly, sitting there staring at me, quite pale, finally faltering. Well, I can't stop to think of his having followed Ina Vandeman South on her wedding trip. If he needs me, and I can help, I must." She broke down completely, and I sat there feeling big-footed and blundering at this revelation of what it was that had put that clear, logical mind of hers off the track, left her confused, groping, just a girl, timid, distrustful of her own judgment where her heart was concerned. "'Was that it all the time?' I asked. "'Well, take it from me. Worth's done nothing of the sort. He's been playing detective not chasing off after some other man's bride. Up came the color to her cheeks. She reached that mite of a hand across to shake on the bargain with, "'I'll go straight down this evening. You'll find me in Santa Isabel when you come, Mr. Boyne.' 
at the Thornhills? It might be handy to have her there, but she shook her head, looking a little self-conscious. I'm taking that spare room at Sarah Capehart's. Skeet wanted me, and I have an invitation from Laura Bowman. But if, well, seeing that this investigation is going to cover all that neighborhood, I thought I'd rather be with Sarah. The level-headed little thing! Pete and I had the pleasure of taking her out to her home where she had her packing to attend to. On the way she spoke of an engagement with Cummings for the theatre Saturday night. And instead I suppose I shall be at the carnival ball. Shall I tell him that in my note, Mr. Boyne? Is it all right to let him know?" "'It's all right,' I assented. "'You can bet Cummings is due down there as soon as Worth shows up, and that must be soon now.' "'Yes,' Barbara agreed. Her face clouded a little. "'You noticed in Skeet's letter that they're expecting Ina tomorrow?' Poor child, she couldn't get away from it. I patted the hand I had taken to say good-bye and assured her again. Worth Gilbert hasn't been in the South. I wonder at you, Barbara. You're so clear-headed about everything else. Don't you see that that would be impossible?" Then I drove back to my office to find lying on my desk a telegram from the young man, dated at Los Angeles, requesting me to meet him at Santa Isabel the following evening. End of chapter 16《Chapter Seventeen of the Million Dollar Suitcase by Alice McGowan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Million Dollar Suitcase, Chapter Seventeen, Cleansing Fires. Wednesday evening I pulled into a different Santa Isabel, lanterns strung across between the buildings, bunting and branches of bloom everywhere, streets alive with people milling around and cars piled high with decorative material, crowded with the decorators. The Carnival of Blossoms was only three days ahead. At Bill Capehart's garage they told me Barbara was out somewhere with the crowd, and a few minutes later on Main Street I met her in a Ford truck. Skeet Thornhill was at the wheel, adding to the general risk of life and limb on Santa Isabel streets, carrying a half a dozen or more other young things tucked away behind. Both girls shouted at me. They were going somewhere for something and would see me later. Getting down toward the Gilbert place, just beyond the corner, I flushed from the shadows of the pepper trees a bird I knew to be one of Dykeman's operatives. Watching his carefully careless progress on past the Gilbert lawn, then the Vandeman grounds, my eye was led to a pair who approached across the green from the direction of the bungalow. No mistaking the woman. Even at this distance, Height and the clean sweep of her walk told me that this was the bride, Ina Vandeman, and the man strolling beside her. Had he come with her from the house or joined her on the cross-cut path? Could that be worth Gilbert? I sat in the roadster and gaped. The evening light, behind them and dim enough at best, made their countenances fairly indistinguishable. At the gap in the hedge they paused, and Mrs. Vandeman reached out, broke off a flower to fasten in his buttonhole looking up into his face, talking quickly. Old stuff, but always good reliable old stuff. Then Worth saw me and hailed, "'Hello, Jerry!' But he did not come to me, and I swung out of the machine to the sidewalk. I heard the sobbing of the Ford truck. It went by, missing my running-board by an inch, stopped at Vandeman's gate, and Skeet discharged her cargo of clamor to stream across the sidewalk and up toward the bungalow. I saw Barbara, in the midst of the moving figures, suddenly stop, knew she had seen the two over there and crossed to her with a cheerful, "'He's here, all right.' Oh, yes, not looking toward the gap in the hedge or at me. He came on the same train with—with with them. Then someone from the porch yelled reproachfully for her to fetch those banners pronto, and with a little catching of breath she ran up the walk. I turned back. Worth and Ina had moved on. Bronson Vandeman, well-groomed, dressed as though he had just come in off the golf links, his English shoes and loud patterned stockings differentiating him from the crude outdoor man of the coast, had joined them on the Gilbert lawn. His genial greeting to me let his bride get by with a mere bow, turning at once back to her house by the front walk. But rather to my annoyance, Vandeman came bounding up the steps after us. 
I judged Worth must have invited him. Chung carried my suitcase upstairs and lingered a minute in my room. I'll swear it wasn't merely to get the tip for which he thanked me, but with the idea of showing me in some recondite oriental fashion that he was glad I'd come. This interested me. The people who were glad to have me in Santa Isabel at this time belonged to the clean side of my ledger. Then I went downstairs to find Vanneman still in the living room, sprawled at ease beside the window, looking round with a display of his fine teeth, reaching a hand to pull in the chair Worth set for me. "'Well, Jerry,' that young man prompted, indicating by a careless gesture the smoker's tray on the table beside me, "'there is time before dinner for the tale of your exploits. How's my friend Steve?' I began to select a cigar, and said shortly, "'It's all in reports waiting for you at my office.' "'Yes,' Worth ignored my irritation. "'Tell it. What did you do down south?' "'Just came back from the South yourself, aren't you?' I countered. "'Sure,' airily. "'But I wasn't there to butt in on your game. Did you find that Skeels was Clayt?' I merely looked over the flame of my match at that small-town society man, smiling back at me with a show of polite interest. "'Go on,' Worth interpreted. "'Vanneman knows all about it. I tried to sell him a few shares of stock in the suitcase, so he'll take an interest in the game. But he's too much the tightwad to buy." "'Oh, no!' deprecated Vanderman. "'Just no gambler. Hate to take a chance.' He ran his fingers through his hair, tossing it up with a gesture I had noticed when he came back from the dance at Tate's. "'All right. Apology accepted,' Worth nodded. "'Anyway, you didn't. Well, Jerry?' Vanderman waited a moment with natural curiosity. Then, as I still said nothing, giving my attention to my smoke, moved reluctantly to rise, saying, "'That means I better chase along and let you two talk business.' "'No, sit tight,' from Worth. I was mad clear through, and disturbed and apprehensive, too. I managed a brief, dry statement of the outcome in the South. Worth hailed it with, "'Skeels lurks in the jungle. Life still holds a grain of interest.' "'Why the devil couldn't you keep me advised of your movements?' I demanded. "'Dykeman's hounds,' he grinned. "'Had them guessing. They'd have had me picked up if I'd gone to your office.' "'You could have written or wired. They've picked you up anyway,' I grunted. "'One's on the job now. Saw him as I came in.' "'Eh? What's that?' cried Vanneman, a man snooping in the shrubbery outside getting more attention from him than the one dodging pursuit three hundred miles away. What do you mean, hounds? And when he had heard the explanation of Dykeman's trailers, I call that intolerable. Oh, I don't know. Worth reached over my shoulder for a cigarette. Lose em whenever I like. I wasn't so certain. There were men in my employ he couldn't shake. Perhaps those reports in Dykeman's desk might have offered some surprises to this cocksure lad. My exasperation at Worth mounted as I listened to Vanderman talking. "'Those bank people should do one thing or another,' he gave his opinion. "'Just because you got gay with them and handed them their payment in the suitcase it left in, they've no right to have you watched like a criminal. In a small town like this, such a thing will ruin a man's standing.' "'If he has any standing,' Worth laughed. "'See here,' Vanderman's smile was persuasive. Don't let what I said out in front embitter you. I'll try not to. Mr. Boyne, Vanderman missed the sarcasm, when I got back to this town today, what do you suppose I found? The story going around that a quarrel with Worth, over money, drove his father to take his own life. That's my business here, I nodded, and when he looked his surprise, to stop such stories. He stared at me, frankly puzzled for a moment then said, "'Well, of course you know, and I know, that they're scurrilous lies. But just how will you stop them?' I had intended my remark to stand as it was, but Worth filled in the pause after Vandemus' question with, "'Jerry's here to get the truth of my father's murder, Bronze.' Murder? The mere naked word seemed to shock Vandemus. His sort clothe and pad everything, even their speech. I didn't know anyone entertained the idea your father was murdered. 
He couldn't have been, not the way it happened. Nevertheless, we think he was. Oh, but Boyne, start a thing like that, and think of the talk it'll make. They'll commence at once saying that there was nobody but Worth to profit by his father's death. Don't worry, Mr. Vanderman. He made me hot. We know where to dig up the motive for the crime. You mean the diaries? Worth's voice sounded unbelievably from beside me. Nothing doing there, Jerry. I've burned them. I sat and choked down the swears. Yet, looking back on it, I saw plainly that Jerry Boyne was the man who deserved kicking. I ought never to have left them with him. "'You read them and burned them?' said Vanderman. "'Burned them without reading,' were his impatient tones corrected. "'Without reading?' the other echoed, startled. Then, after a long pause, "'Oh, I say, pardon me, but—' But ought that to have been done? Surely not. Worth, if you'd read your father's diaries for the past few years, I don't believe you'd have a doubt that he committed suicide. Not a doubt." Worth sat there mute. Myself, I was rather curious as to what Vanderman would say. I had read much in those diaries. But when it came, it was the same old line of talk one hears when there's a suicide. Gilbert was a lonely man. His life hadn't been happy. He cut himself off from people too much. Vanderman said that, of late, he believed he was pretty nearly the only intimate the dead man had. This last gave him an interest in my eyes. I broke in on his generalities to ask him bluntly why he was so certain the death was suicide. Mr. Gilbert was breaking up. Had been for two years or more. Worth's been away. He's not seen it. But I can tell you, Boyne, his father's mind was affected." Worth let that pass, though I could see he wasn't convinced by Vanderman's sentimentalities any more than I was. After the man had gone, I turned on Worth sharply with, "'Why the devil did you tell that pink tea proposition about your dealings with the Van S. Avenue Bank?' "'Safety valve, I guess. I get up too heavy a load of steam, and it's easy to blow it off to Vanderman told him most of it in the smoker, coming up. You'll talk about anything in a smoker." "'Oh, will you?' I said in exasperation. "'And you'll burn anything, I suppose, that a match'll set fire to?' "'Go easy, Jerry Boyne.' His chin dropped to his chest. He sat glowering out through the window. "'Cleansing fires for that sort of garbage,' he said finally. "'I burned them on the day of his funeral.' End of chapter 17「Chapter 18 of the Million Dollar Suitcase by Alice McGowan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Million Dollar Suitcase. Chapter 18. The Torn Page. My coming had thrown dinner late. We were barely through with the meal and back once more in the living room when the latch of the French window rattled, the window itself was pushed open, and a high, imperious voice proclaimed, "'The Princess of China, calling on Mr. Worth Gilbert!' There stood Ina Vanderman in the gorgeously embroidered robes of a high-caste Chinese lady, her fair hair covered by a sleek black wig that struck out something odd, almost ominous in the coloring of her skin the very planes of her features. Outside, along the porch, sounded the patter of many feet. Skeet wriggled through the narrow frame under her tall sister's arm, came scooting into the room to turn and gaze back at her. "'Doesn't she look the vamp?' "'Skeet!' Ina had sailed in by this time, and Ernestine followed more soberly. "'You've been told not to say that!' "'I think,' the other twin backed her up virtuously, with poor mother sick and all, you might respect her wishes. You know what she said about calling Ina a vamp." And Skeet drawled innocently. "'That it hit too near the truth to be funny, wasn't that it?' Through the open window had followed a half-dozen more of the Blossom Festival crowd, Barbara and Bronson Vanderman among them. Ina paid no attention to anyone, standing there, her height increased by the long, straight lines of the costume her bisque doll features given a strange, pallid dignity by the raw magnificence 
of its crusted purple and crimson and green and gold embroidery and dead black wig. "'Isn't it an exquisite thing, Worth?' displaying herself before him. "'Bronze has a complete Mandarin costume. We lead the Grand March as the Emperor and Empress of Mongolia. Don't you think it's a good idea?' First rate Worth spoke in his usual unexcited fashion, and it was difficult to say whether he meant the Oriental idea or the appearance of the girl who stood before him. She came close and offered the cuff of one of her sleeves to show him the embroidery, lifting a delicate chin to display the jade buttons at the neck. Barbara, over on the other side of the room, refused to meet my eye. Mrs. Bowman, a big fur piece pulled up around her throat, shivered. I met half a dozen Santa Isabel people whose names I've forgotten. I could see that Bronson Vanderman socially took the lead here, that everybody looked to him. The room was a babble of talk when a few minutes later the doorbell rang in orthodox fashion, and Chung ushered Cummings in upon the general confusion. Some of the bunch knew and spoke to him, others didn't and had to be presented. It took the first of his time and attention. He only got a chance for one swipe at me a low-toned, sarcastic, "'Made a mistake to duck me, Boyne.' I didn't think it worth while to answer that. Presently I saw him standing with Barbara. He was evidently effecting a switch of his theatre engagement to the ball, for I heard Skeets. "'Mr. Cummings wants a ticket. He'll need two. Ten dollars, Mr. Cummings, five apiece.' "'No, no, Skeet,' Barbara laughed embarrassedly. "'Mr. Cummings was just joking.' He'll not be here Saturday night. I'll come back for it. Hand in pocket. It's a masquerade. Barbara hesitated. Bring my costume with me from San Francisco. I'm not sure. Again Barbara hesitated. Ski cut in on her. Why, Barbara Wallace, it's what you came to Santa Isabel for. The Bloss. Fess. Ball. And to think of your getting a perfectly good man right at the last minute this way, and not having to tag on to Bronze and Ina or something like that. I think you're the lucky girl." And she clutched Cummings' offered payment to stow it with other funds she had collected. At last they got themselves out of the room and left us alone with Cummings. He had carried through his little deal with Barbara as though it meant considerable to him, but I knew that his errand with Worth was serious and put in quickly. I intended to write or phone you tomorrow, Cummings. Well, the lawyer worked his mouth a bit under that bristly mustache and looked at Worth. It might have saved you some embarrassment if you'd been warned of my errand here tonight. Earlier, that is. I suppose Captain Gilbert has told you that I phoned him, when I failed to connect with you, that I was coming here, and what I was coming for? I didn't tell, Jerry. Worth picked up a cigarette. Couldn't very well tell him what you were coming for. Don't know myself. The words were blunt. Really, I think there was no intention to offend, only the simple statement of a fact. But I could see Cummings beginning to simmer, as he inquired, "'Does that mean you didn't understand my words on the phone, or that you understood them and couldn't make out what I meant by them?' "'A little of both,' allowed Worth. Cummings stepped close to him and let him have it direct. "'I'm here tonight, Captain Gilbert, as executor of your father's estate. I have filed the will today.' I might have done so earlier, but when I inventoried this place, you remember the day before the funeral, you were here at the time, I failed to locate a considerable portion of your father's estate. You failed to locate? All the estates here, this house, the downtown properties? What do you mean, fail to locate? I wasn't alluding to realty, said Cummings. It's my duty to locate and report to the court the present whereabouts of seventy-five thousand dollars worth of stock in the Van Ness Avenue Savings Bank. Can you declare to me as executor where it is? And, if any other person than your father placed it in its present whereabouts, are you ready to declare to me how and when it came into that person's possession?" "'Quite a lot of words, Cummings. But it doesn't mean anything,' Worth said casually. "'You know where that bank stock is, and who put it there.' Officially, I do not know. Officially, I demand to be told. Unofficially, answer it for yourself. Worth turned his back on the lawyer to get a match from the mantel. Very well. 
My answer is that I intend to find out how and when that bank stock, which formed a part of your payment to the Van Ness Avenue Bank, disappeared from this house. I admit I was scared. Here was the first gun of the coming battle, and I was sure this enemy, who stood now looking through half-closed eyes at the lad's back, would have poisoned gas among his weapons. He had emphasized the when. He believed that the stories of Worth's night visit to his father were true, that the implied denial by Barbara and myself in my office was false, that Worth had either received the stock from his father that Saturday night or taken it unlawfully. I was sure that it was the stock certificates which I had seen Worth take from the safe compartment of the sideboard in the small hours of Monday morning, a breach of legal form which it would be possible for a friendly executor to pass over. Cummings, Worth inherits everything under his father's will. What's the difference about a small irregularity in taking possession? He— Never explain, Jerry. Worth shut me up. Your friends don't need it, and your enemies won't believe it. Cummings had stood where he was since the first of the interview. His face went strangely livid. There was more in this than a legal fight. Yes. Boyne's a fool to try to help your case with explanations, Gilbert. He choked out. I'll see that both of you get a chance to answer questions elsewhere, under oath. Good evening. He turned and left. He had the best of it all around. I endeavored for some time to get before Worth the dangers of his high-handed defiance of law, order, probate judges, and the court's officers, in the person of Alan G. Cummings' attorney and his father's executor. He listened, yawned, and suggested that it must be nearly bedtime. I gave it up, and we went, I at least with a sense of danger ahead upon me, to our rooms. Along in the middle of the night I waked to the knowledge that a casement window was pounding somewhere in the house. For a while I lay and listened in that helpless, exaggerated resentment one feels at such a time. I drop off, get nearly to sleep, only to be jerked broad awake again by the thudding. Listening carefully, I decided that the bothersome window was in Worth's room, and finally I got up sense and spunk enough to roll out of bed stick my feet into slippers, and sneak over with the intention of locking it. The room was dimly lighted from the street lamps, far away as they were. I made my way across it. Worth's deep, regular breathing was quite undisturbed. I had trouble with the catch, went and felt over the bureau and found his flashlight, fixed the window by its help, and returning it, remembering how near I came to knocking it off the bureau top, thought to put it in a drawer which stood half open. As I aimed it downward, its circle of illumination showed something projecting a corner from beneath the swirl of ties and a sheaf of collars. A book. A red, morocco-bound book. Mechanically, I nudged the stuff away with the torch itself. What lay there turned me cold. It was the 1920 diary. My fingers relaxed. The flashlight fell with a thump as I let out an exclamation of dismay. A sleepy voice inquired from the bed. "'Hi, you Jerry. What are you up to in here?' For answer I dragged out the book, went over to the bed, and switched on the reading lamp there. Worth scowled in the glare and flung his arms up back of his head for a pillow to raise it a bit. "'Yeah,' blinking amiably at the volume. "'Met to tell you. Found it today when I was down in the repair pit at the garage. It had been stuck in the drainpipe there.' And I suppose, I said savagely, that if I hadn't come on to it now, you'd have burned this too. Don't get sore, Jerry, he said. I saved it. And he yawned. I had an uncontrollable impulse to have a look at that last entry, which would record the bitter final quarrel between this boy and his father. No difficulty about finding the spot. As I raised the book in my hands it fell open of itself at the place. I looked, and what I saw choked me, got crosswise in my throat for a moment so no words could come out. I stuck the book under his nose and held it there till I could whisper, "'Worth, did you do this?' The last written page was numbered forty-nine. On it was recorded the date, March 6th, the weather cloudy, clearing late in the afternoon, the fact that the sun had set red in a cloudless sky. 
and it ended abruptly in the middle of a phrase. The leaf that carried page fifty had been torn out, not cut away carefully as were those leaves in the earlier book, but ripped loose, grabbed with clutching fingers that scarred and twisted the leaf below. He shoved my hand away and stared at me. For a moment I thought everything was over. Certainly I could not be a very appealing sight, standing there sweating with fear, my hair all stuck up on my head where I'd clawed it, shivering in my nightclothes more from miserable nervousness than from cold. But somehow those eyes of his softened. He gave me one of the looks that people who care for worth will go far to get, and said quietly, "'You see what you're doing? I told you I didn't steal the book, so that clears me in your mind of being the murderer. Now you're after me about this torn-out page. If I'd torn it out and stolen it, you and I would know what it would mean.' "'But, boy,' I began, when he suffered a change of heart, "'get out of here. Take that damn book and leave.' He heaved himself over in the bed, hunching the covers about his ears, turning his back on me. As I crept away, I heard him finish in a sort of mutter, as though to himself, "'I'm sorry for you, Jerry Boyne.'" End of chapter 18《Chapter 19 of the Million Dollar Suitcase by Alice McGowan This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Million Dollar Suitcase Chapter 19 On the Hilltop Morning dawned on the good ship Jerry Boyne, not so dismasted and rudderless as you might have thought. I'd carried that 1920 diary to my room, and before I slept, read the whole of it. This was the last word we had from the dead man. Here, if anywhere, would be found support for the suggestions of a weakening mind and suicide. Nothing of that sort here. On the contrary, Thomas Gilbert was very much his clear-headed, unpleasant, tyrannical self to the last stroke of the pen. But I came on something to build up a case against Eddie Hughes, the chauffeur. I didn't get much sleep. As soon as I heard Chung moving around I went down, had him give me a cup of coffee, then stationed him on the back porch and walked to the study, shut myself in, and discharged my heavy police revolver into a corner of the fireplace. Then, with the front door open, fired again. "'How many shots?' I called to Chung. "'One time shoot!' Worth's head poked from his upstairs window as he shouted, "'What's the excitement down there?' "'Trying my gun. How many times did I fire?' "'Once, you crazy Indian!' and the question of soundproof walls was settled. Nobody heard the shot that killed Gilbert twenty feet away from the study if the door was closed. Mrs. Thornhill's ravings, as described in Skeet's letter to Barbara, were merely delirium. I walked out around the driveway to the early morning streets of Santa Isabel. The little town looked as peaceful and innocent as a pan of milk. In an hour or so its ways would be full of people rushing about getting ready for the carnival a curious contrast to my own business, sinister, tragic. It seemed to me that two currents moved almost as one, the hidden, dark part under, for there must be those in the town who knew the crime was murder, the murderer himself must still be here, and the foam of noisy gaiety and blossoms riding atop. A blossom festival, the boyhood of the year, and I was in the midst of it, hunting a murderer. An hour later I talked to Barbara in the stuffy little front room at Capehart's, brow beaten by the noise of Sarah getting breakfast on the other side of the thin board partition, more disconcerted by the girl's manner of receiving the information of how I had found the 1920 diary hidden in Worth's bureau drawer. There was a swift, very personal anger at me. I had to clear myself instantly and thoroughly of any suspicion of believing for a moment that Worth himself had stolen or mutilated the book, protesting, "'I don't! I don't! Listen, Barbara, be reasonable! That means, Barbara, be scared, and I won't. When they're scared, people make mistakes. You might see differently if you'd been there last night when Cummings made his charge against Worth. That seventy-two thousand dollars Worth carried up to the city Monday morning he had taken from his father's safe the night before.' For a minute she just looked at me, 
and not even worth Gilbert's daredevil eyes ever held a more inclusively defiant light than those big, soft, dark ones of hers. Well, wasn't it his? All right, I said shortly. I'm not here to talk of Worth's financial methods. They're scheduled to get him into trouble. But let that pass. Look through this book, and you'll see who it is I'm after. She had already opened the volume and began to glance along the pages. She made a motion for me to wait. I leaned back in my chair, and it was only a few moments later that she looked up to say, "'Don't make the arrest, Mr. Boyne. You have nothing here against Eddie for murder.' Because I doubted myself, I began to scold, winding up, "'All the same, if that gink hasn't jumped town, I'll arrest him.' "'It would be a good deal more logical to arrest him if he had jumped the town,' Barbara reminded me. "'If you really want to see him, Mr. Boyne, You'll find him at the garage around on the highway. He's working for Bill." That was a setback. A fleeing Eddie Hughes might have been hopeful. An Eddie Hughes who gave his employer back talk, got himself fired, and then settled down within hand-reach was not so good a bet. Barbara saw how it hit me, and offered a suggestion. "'Mr. Boyne, Worth and I are taking a hike out to San Leandro Canyon this afternoon to get ferns for the decorating committee. Suppose you come along, anyhow, a part of the way, and have a quiet talk, all alone with us. Don't do anything until you have consulted Worth." "'All right. I'll go you,' I assented, and half-past two saw the three of us, Worth in corduroys and puttees, Barbara with high boots and short, dust-brown skirt, tramping out past the homes of people toward the open country. At the Vanneman place Skeet's truck was out in front, piled with folding chairs, frames, light lumber, and a lot of decorative stuff. The tall Chinaman came from the house with another load. "'You Barbara Wallace!' the flapper howled. "'Aren't you ashamed to be walking off with Worth and Mr. Boyne both, and good men scarce as hen's teeth and Santa Isabel today?' "'I'm not walking off with them. They're walking off with me,' Barbara laughed at her. "'Shameless one!' Skeet drawled. I see you let Mr. Cummings have a day off. Aren't you the kind little boss to him?" I just raised my brows at Barbara, and she explained a bit hastily. Skeet thinks she has to be silly over the fact that Mr. Cummings has gone up to town, I suppose. She added with fine indifference, he'll be back in the morning. You bet he'll be back in the morning, Worth assured the world. Now what does he mean by that, Mr. Boyne? He means Cummings is out after him. I don't. Worth contradicted me personally. I mean he's after Bob's. She knows it. Look at her. She glanced up at me from under her hat brim, all the stars out in those shadowy pools that were her eyes. The walk had brought sumptuous color to her cheeks, where the two extra deep dimples began to show. You both may think, she began with a sobriety that belied the dimples and shining eyes, looking on from the outside, that Mr. Cummings has an idea of, as Skeet would say, rushing me. But when we're alone together, about all he talks of is Worth." "'Bad sign,' Worth flung over a shoulder that he pushed a little in advance of us. "'Takes the old fellows that way. Their notion of falling for a girl is to fight all the other Johnnies in sight. Guess you've got him going, Bobs.' I walked along, chewing over the matter. She'd estimated Cummings fairly, as she did most things that she turned that clear mind of hers on, but her lack of vanity kept her from realizing, as I did, that he was in the way to become a dangerous personal enemy to Worth. His self-interest, she thought, would eventually swing him to Worth's side. She didn't as yet perceive that a motive more powerful than self-interest had hold of him now. "'Why, Mr. Boyne,' she answered, as though I'd been speaking my thoughts aloud. I've known Mr. Cummings for years and years. He never—' "'You said a mouthful there, Bobs,' Worth halted, grinning to interrupt her. "'He never, none whatever. But he has now. He hasn't. Leave it to Jerry. Jerry saw him that first night in at Tate's, then afterward in the office.' "'Oh, come on!' Barbara started ahead impatiently. "'What difference would it make?' They went on ahead of me, scrapping briskly, as a boy and girl do who have grown up together. 
I stumped along after and reflected on the folly of mankind in general, and that of Alan G. Cummings in particular. That careful, mature bachelor had seen this lustrous young creature blossom to her present perfection. He'd no doubt offered her safe and sane attention, and when she came to live in San Francisco where they had friends in common. But it had needed worth Gilbert's appearance on the scene to wake him up to his own real feeling. Forty-five, on the chase of nimble, sweet and twenty. Cummings was in for sore feet and humiliating tumbles, and we were in for the worst he could do to us. I sighed. Worth had more than one way of making enemies, it seemed. At last we came in sight of the country club upon its rise of ground overlooking the golf links. The low brown clubhouse, built bungalow fashion, with a long front gallery and gravel sweep, was swarming with people, the decorators. Motors came and went. The grounds were being strung with paper lanterns. We skirted these and the links itself, where there were two or three players, obstinate, defiant old men who would have their game in spite of forty blossom festivals, climbed a fence and crossed the grass up to the crest of a little round hill, halting there for the view. It wasn't high, but standing free as it did, it commanded pretty nearly the entire Santa Isabel district. Massed acres of pink and white, the great orchards ran one into the other without break for miles. The lanes between the trunks, diamonded like a harlequin's robe in mathematical primness, were newly turned furrows of rich black soil, against which the gray or sometimes whitewashed trunks of apricot, peach and plum trees gave contrast. Then the cap of glorious blossoms, meeting overhead in the older orchards, with a warm blue sky above and puffs of clouds that matched the pure white of the plum tree's bloom. The spot suited me well. We had left the town behind us. Here neither Dykeman's spotter nor anyone he hired to help him could get within listening distance. I dropped down on a bank. Worth and Barbara disposed themselves, he sprawling his length, she sitting cross-legged just below him. It wasn't easy to make a beginning. I knew it wouldn't do me any particular good with Worth to dwell on his danger. But I finally managed to lay it fairly before them my case against Hetty Hughes, and I must say that, as I told it, it sounded pretty strong. I didn't want to put too much stress on having found my evidence in the diaries. I knew Worth was as obstinate as a mule. And, having said that, he would not stand for anyone being prosecuted on their evidence. He'd stick to it till the skies fell. I called on my memory of those pages, now unfortunately ashes and not get edible, and explained that Worth's father hired Hughes directly after a jailbreak at San Jose had roused the whole country. Three of the four escapes were rounded up in the course of a few days, but the fourth, known to us as Eddie Hughes, was safe in Thomas Gilbert's garage, working there as chauffeur having been employed without recommendation on the strength of what he could do. And the low wages he was willing to take, Worth put in dryly. Old stuff, Jerry. I wasn't sure till you spilled it, just now, that my father was wise to it. But I knew. What you getting at? Just this. When I talked to Hughes that first night, I came down here with you, while we all supposed that death a suicide, we couldn't keep his resentment against your father his hatred of him from boiling over every time he was mentioned. "'Get on,' said Worth wearily. "'Father hired a jailbird that came cheap. Probably put it to himself that he was given the man a chance to go straight.' I glanced up. This was just about what I remembered Thomas Gilbert to have said in the entry that told of the hiring of Eddie. Worth nodded grimly at my startled face. "'Eddie's gone straight since then,' he filled in. That is, he's kept out of jail, which is going straight for Eddie. He'd certainly hate the man who held him as he's been held for five years. Not motive enough for murder, though. There's more. The 1920 diary you gave me last night tells when and why the extra bolts were put on the study doors. Your father had been missing liquor and cigars and believed Hughes was taking them. Pilfering, with an expression of distaste. That doesn't. Hold on. I stopped him. On February 12th, your father left money, marked coin and paper money, as if by accident, on the top of the liquor cabinet, not exposed, but dropped in under the edge of the big ashtray so it might look as though it were forgotten, in a sense, lost there. How much? 
came the quick question. Fifty-one dollars. He looked around at me. Just one dollar above the limit of petty larceny. A hundred cents added to put it in the felony class that meant state's prison. So he could have sent Eddie to the pen, eh? I guess you've got a motive there, Boyne. Well, er... Uh, I squirmed over my statement, blurting out finally, Hughes didn't take the money. Knew it was a trap. Worth's laugh was bitter, and hated the man who cold-bloodedly said it to catch him. If he didn't take it, don't you think he counted it? Worth, I said sharply, your father put those bolts on and continued to find that he was being robbed. He was mad about it. Any man would be. Say what you will, no one likes to find that persons in his employ are stealing from him. The aggravating thing was that he couldn't bring it home to Hughes, though he was sure of the fact. So he went back to what he had known of Eddie when he hired him. After profiting by it for five years he was going to rake that up? He was, a bit nettled, and well within his rights to do so. Three weeks before he was shot he wrote that he'd started the inquiry. There was no further mention of the matter in the book as it stands, but don't you see that the results of the inquiry must have been on that torn-out last page? Eddie's Saturday night alibi won't hold water. His cannery girl, of course, will swear he was with her, but there's no corroborating testimony. No one saw them together from nine till twelve. Dead silence dropped on us, with the white clouds standing like witnesses in the blue above the wind bringing now and again on its scented wings little faint echoes of the noise down at the clubhouse. "'What more do you want?' Both young faces were set against me, cold and hostile. Here was motive, opportunity, a suspect capable of the deed. My theory is that Mr. Gilbert came in on Hughes, caught him in the act of stealing from the cabinet. Hughes jumped for the pistol over the fireplace, got it, fired the fatal shot, and placed the dead man's fingers about the butt of the gun. Then he picked up the diary lying on the table, tore out the leaf about himself, and poked the rest of the book down the drain-pipe. "'And the shot?' Worth resisted me. "'Why didn't the shot bring Chung on the run?' "'Because he couldn't hear it. Nobody'd hear it ten paces away. That's what I was trying out this morning. You told me I'd fired once. Well, I fired twice.' Once with the door shut, and neither you nor Chung heard it. Afterward, with the door open, the report you registered. The blotter, and it had been used on that last page, showed no words to strengthen this theory of yours, said Barbara, as confidently as though the little blue square had been clear print instead of broken blurring. Perhaps it was clear to her. I was glad I'd given it a thorough re-examination the night before. I think it does. I struggled against the tide, manfully, buoying myself up with the tracing of the blotter. Here's the word demanded, reasonably connected with the affair. The letters L-L-E-R may be the last end of caller, or possibly fuller. I noticed Gilbert spoke in a former entry of the bottle in the cabinet and Hughes snitching from it, and used the word fuller. Here's the word avenue, complete, and Lizzie Watkins, Hughes' girl, lives on Myrtle Avenue. The silence after that was fairly derisive. Worth broke it with an impatient, and the fact of the bolted doors throws all that stuff out. Well, I grunted, Barbara deduced the slipping of some bolts to please you once, why can't she again? Mr. Boyne, the girl spoke quickly, it wouldn't help you a bit to be assured that Eddie Hughes could enter the study and leave it bolted behind him when he went out, help you to the truth, I mean. These facts you've gathered are all wobbly. They'll never in the world fit in trim and true. They're hardly facts at all. They're partial facts. Wouldn't help me, I ejaculated. It would cinch a case against him. We've got to have someone in jail, and that shortly. We're forced to. Forced? Worth had sat up a little and reached far forward for a stone that lay among the weeds down there. He spoke to me sidewise with a challenging flicker of the eye. Barbara kept her lips tight shut. "'I need a prisoner,' trying to correct my error, then burst out. "'My lord, children, an arrest isn't going to hurt a man like Hughes, even if he proves to be innocent. It's an old story to him. 
Barbara, you said yourself that the man who stole the 1920 diary was the murderer. But I didn't say Eddie Hughes stole it. Her tone was significant, and it checked me. I couldn't remember what the deuce she had said that night. There recurred to me her mimicry of a woman's voice, Laura Bowman's, as I believed, to determine through Chung who Thomas Gilbert's feminine visitor had been. Should that clue have been followed up before I moved on Eddie Hughes? Even as I got to this point, I heard Worth, punctuating his remarks with the wang of his rock on the bit of twig he was pounding to pieces. Boyne, I won't stand for any arrest being made except in all sincerity. The person you honestly believe to be the criminal. Does that mean you forbid me, in so many words, to proceed against Hughes on what I've got? It does, Worth said. You're not convinced yourself. Leave it alone. Nuff said. I jumped to my feet. If he wouldn't let me lay hands on Hughes, there was nothing to do but go after the next one. You two run along. Get your ferns. There's a man at the club here I have to see. Barbara was afoot instantly. Worth lay looking at her for a moment, then heaved himself up, shook his shoulders, and stood beside her. "'Race you to the foot of the hill,' she flashed up at him. "'You're on,' he chuckled. "'I'll give you a running start, to the tree down there, and beat you.' They were off. She ran like a deer. Worth got away as though he was in earnest. He caught her up just at the finish. I couldn't see which one won, but they walked a few rods hand in hand. Something swelled in my throat as I watched them away. Life's springtime, and the years. Boy and girl running, like kids that had never known a fear or a mortal burden, over an earth greener than any other, because its time of verdure is brief, dreaming already of the golden tan of California midsummer, under boughs where tree blooms made all the air sweet. For sake of the boy and the girl who didn't know enough to take care of their own happiness, I wheeled and galloped in the direction of the country club. There is an institution known, and respected, in police circles as the Holy Scare. I was determined to make use of it. I'd throw a Holy Scare into a man I knew, and see what came out. End of chapter 19